Hey, Internet. The three-year lectionary for this week has a fascinating little attempt to connect Old and Old Testament and Gospel. It never quite achieves this the same way the one year does, but it's it's there. It's all about the shepherding love of Jesus and the desire of Jesus to not let anything get in the way of him saving those who are his sheep, which you got to know heading into the, the thing to begin with. And that's you. You're listening. You've heard it. You heard about his resurrection. You believe it. You're a sheep. You baptized. You're definitely his sheep. You feast upon his body and blood. He's guaranteeing you you're his sheep. And he is going to see it done that your salvation comes to pass. You want to hang on to that as we move through all of these texts here. So, Old Testament reading is Ezekiel chapter 34. Oh, why did it do that now? Ezekiel chapter 34, 11 to 24. Thus says the Lord, I, I myself will search for my sheep. Right there, you have the gospel to preach. That is it. That is the heart of the matter. Well, how is that the gospel? It doesn't say Jesus died. You're right. It doesn't say it specifically. But it declares to you that God is going to be the one to bring salvation to pass. It's not going to be the pastors. It's not going to be the church. It's not going to be the Christians. It's not going to be the mission-driven purpose, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be him. He's going to do it. I myself. Check it out, guys. Behold, I'm not holding back. I myself will go get my sheep. And when Jesus incarnates into Bethlehem, that is exactly what he is doing. I will rescue them, it says, right? I will rescue them from all the places they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. Ezekiel is the one writing this. Think of the exile. Remember that Jerusalem is falling or has fallen. The dispersion to the nations has happened. So he is saying that this is going to be undone. And of course, Peter told us last week in the Old Testament lectionary that now that is being undone through the gospel going to the nations, which includes again, you. I will gather them. I will feed them on good pasture. I myself, I myself, I will, I will, I will, I will. See all that? The gospel. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. I will build my church, Jesus said. What a what a foundational promise to trust in. We don't have to send people out to do mission in order to build the church. We send people out to do mission because Jesus is building his church and we know it's going to happen. Nah, that's what they're going to proclaim is that these words are his words, repent, believe, he's risen from the dead, be baptized, it is eternal life. I will build them up. But he says, this is weird, this often gets cut off. It may even be an optional text. This year, I don't don't know if it is, one year it is, it's optional, you can cut it off here. He says, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. So in the midst of this, I'm going to go save my people. He also says, oh, by the way, I'm going to destroy those who are not my people. And that is a terrifying thing. Technically, it fits in the world of law, but I think you got to be careful. Law gospel is such a jargonized thing. We mean so many different things when we say it. This isn't the kind of law that you should really use on your people. Like, well, you are the fat and the strong, but he saved you. And no, 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 no. This is talking about how there's a, there are those who will not be saved. And they are those who, what he's going to say, push aside with shoulder and hoof those who basically want to shove the sheep out of the way to get their stuff. Yeah. Stick with this for a moment. Fat and the strong, those who look great, who look wise. This is like the opposite of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek and sad and weak and mourning and all this kind of stuff. This is the not blessed are the strong and the rich, the woes which come later in the book of Luke. That's what this is. But as for you, my flock, he goes on, you know, this is good news for you too, that I'm going to judge against your enemies. Those who would try to steal my word from you, I'm going to make sure they can't do it anymore. I will judge between sheep and sheep, rams and male goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture? You must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture. So he's speaking to the unbelieving world. Isn't it enough that you're ruining the world by rebelling against me? You got to try to like keep Christians from being saved too. Isn't it enough that you don't believe the word of God when you come to church? You just kind of come, whatever, but now you're going to stop other people from hearing it? Yeah. You ever have that argument about weekly communion where someone's like, well, I don't eat it every week. So, well, okay, but maybe other people do. Isn't it enough? You got to tread it down. You got to ruin it for others too. Must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet? Because you push with side and shoulder, I will rescue my flock. Right. So he's coming against those who are unbelievers, who are pushing the word of God out of the way. He's coming to bring that word back in such certainty 
that it will absolutely, I will, I will, I will feed my sheep, rescue my sheep. This has to call to mind for you, by the way, Jesus' reinstitution of Peter in the latter chapter of John, where he says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Yeah. Well, there's Jesus doing it and sending the church to preach the New Testament gospel that it is done as How's he going to do it? I will set up over them one shepherd, one pastor, one king, my servant David. Well, David himself? No, he's still in the tomb. Peter preaches that at Pentecost, but his son, Jesus of Nazareth, he shall feed them. How? Take ye. This is my body. That's how. Ooh, look at that. I shall feed them. He shall feed them. And, and, and my servant David shall be prince. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I love it. I've done it. I've done it. It's gonna come to pass. Now, how the epistle fits into this is wiggly, but, but I love this text. It's so good. You could just leave the, leave the rest of it. Just do this thing, except you're missing some of the most important part of the text, which is the verses that precede it. Because right away, you're going to have a bunch of reference that are not in the text. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. Certain persons swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion. Okay, so what's the these that they've wandered away from? And what is the charge that has been given? And uh, it's amazing that we cut this out. The charge is to guard pure doctrine. That's it. Yeah. I left you in Crete, Timothy, so you would guard pure doctrine and tell all the people who don't like it to shut up and go away. I mean, I'm not saying go say that, Pastor. I'm not saying that say to your buddy, be nice, be gentle, learn how to win friends, influence people, use earthly wealth to create friends for heaven, all that kind of stuff. But do not let someone who's a false teacher push aside the word of God. They must be silenced. They must be told, no, I'm sorry. That is not true. That is not what God has said. That's what he says to young Pastor Timothy. I left you in Crete to do that. And now he says the aim of our charge that you would silence false teaching is love. So doctrine and and, and truth are not opposed to each other, right? I'm assuming doctrine and love. Doctrine and love are not opposed to each other. They're not against each other. It is not unloving to love pure doctrine. Now, there are people who are unloving, who use pure doctrine as a hammer to try to hurt people. Well, that's, that's bad. That would be not this. But the aim of the charge of pure doctrine, of right teaching, of straight orthodoxy from the mouth of Jesus and the text of scripture is love that would flow out of a pure heart. Think of it as one that is what? Justified? One that knows the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, and in it finds that God desires mercy, not sacrifice? A good conscience, you know, one that's been forgiven and is clean? A sincere faith, uh, that would be someone who trusts in, well, God's Word to be what it is, and Jesus to be who He has declared Himself to be. Love flows from those things in the pure doctrine which gives it to you. And certain persons, by swerving from these, the pure doctrine, and thus the love, Ultimately, no matter how much they might say, love, 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 they don't. And the faith, no matter how much they may say, I believe, they don't. Uh, And you know it because they don't have a clean conscience. Because they're always justifying themselves and not able to admit it. Uh, And because, well, they're always turning you away from from Jesus and back to yourself. Uh, In this, they've wandered away into vain discussion. They're talking about all sorts of nonsense. Things that have nothing to do with the scriptures. That aren't really based, though, they'll like use the scriptures as a pretext to go talk about what they would rather talk about. You know, I once heard a guy preach on row your boat. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. I really heard him preach on that. Like that was the whole sermon. Yeah, vain discussion. That'd be what that is. Desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding. Yeah. Now, is the law here the law of Ten Commandments, or is it the law of Torah, meaning both law and gospel? I think you can take it either way, although he's going to be talking about the law being laid down for lawbreakers in a moment, so maybe he's really leaning on the the do this part of the law. His point is that the false teacher then, whatever they want to be a teacher of, when they get to the law, they're not going to have understanding. So they're not going to really be able to teach it, which means they're going to use it to justify themselves, because that's all false teaching can ever do is justify itself. And so they'll make these confident assertions about the law. Oh, this is for sure and that, and you should do this and be that and blah, 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 and law, gospel, law, gospel. But then they don't actually rightly distinguish the two, and they turn the law in a fuzzy, confusing way into part of your salvation, as opposed to part of your creation. Very different things there in that. So Paul does tell us, this doesn't mean we don't, don't love the law. Of course we love the law. We know the law is good if you use it lawfully. Uh, and that you should understand this about it. And this is the thing that, if you're in that debate about law, gospel, third use right now, out in the world, like, like you should ponder this verse for a while. What does he mean? 
that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient. Don't say that's because that's second use, because it ain't what he's talking about. It is not. This is no second use thing here. The law is not laid down for the just. That's the justified. That's the righteous. That's the Christian. But for the unjust, you know, the ungodly, the sinner, the unholy, the profane, those who strike fathers and mothers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the glorious gospel. He's not telling you that it, those, those are the Christians in your pew. Those are those who need to hear the law that they might be brought to repentance. That doesn't mean the Christian in the pew doesn't understand this or ever need this law. But to, but to get it this way, why is the law laid down? Right? Where is it given for? What is it given unto? And it is not given because we were righteous in the garden. Nah? Or because we were righteous after the garden. It's given because we are unrighteous as a whole. Huh? And thus the work of the law is always against the flesh and nothing more. Nah? Hey, now, now, don't get me wrong. I, I'm with you. Third use that the, the saint sees the law and loves it. We love the way the creation is built to be, but we would never have needed to be told any of it without the sin within us. Huh? And then in this, he's saying now, you know, this is laid down for the fallen world, and so if you don't understand that it can't save you, it has nothing to do with your salvation, you're going to use it unlawfully. You're going to lose it, use it unjustly, uh, and you actually will not be able to escape this group that he's talking about there. I think that made sense what I said. Eh, feel free to challenge me on it. It is the highest art. He then breaks into a, a salutation and, and a doxology of sorts, just thanking God that he actually sees Jesus now, that he's been judged faithful. And he wants some gospel, by the way. Here it is. He judged me faithful. This Paul is not saying, God looked at me and he realized I'd do pretty good if he made me a Christian. No, he's saying that just, I wasn't a Christian and God judged me Christian. You are a Christian now. Bam, fall off your horse. Huh, yeah, you're persecuting me, but I'm going to show you what it means to suffer for my name. Come get baptized. Uh, that is him judging Paul faithful. That is what God does to you in your baptism. He judges you faithful. Huh? Uh, I got a question recently about what to tell somebody who isn't sure that they believe. And the question was about an answer, which was we should tell them to go to the Lord's Supper and confess they don't believe there. Huh? And, and well, is that true? And then the discussion got into a little bit of, well, was this person baptized? Is this person already a Christian? Has they, have they been catechized? And I would totally agree that if the person's never been catechized, that's the wrong answer. I'd point them back to baptism rather than the supper at that point. But the point is, if, if you have a struggle with your faith, but you've been given these promises, and you're not declaring you don't believe in Jesus, you hate him, he can be cursed and die, well, then you still believe. You're a faintly glimmering wick, and the answer is to stop arguing with God about what he says about you. He's judged you faithful. He has put you into Christ. That's his decision, not yours. Stop arguing with him. He's Almighty God. Little little punk. You know, be quiet. No, he's God. Just let it be. You know, shut up. <laughs> you know, and that's a great gospel. It's an amazing good news to be able to say that to your flesh then. Your flesh has nothing to say. The saying is trustworthy, deserving of full, full acceptance that Jesus came to save the sinners. I'm the foremost of these, and that displays his perfect patience. So don't, don't sit there and say, well, I'm worse, I'm worse. No, you're not. God knows who you are. Yeah. And he has judged you faithful in Christ. That's his baptismal promise to you. And this pure doctrine is the source of faith and love and a clean conscience, and we should not get away from it. Now, now, now we're back to shepherd with Luke 15, right? The shepherd stuff. So we're going to have Jesus' parable of the, the lost sheep, and he tells us in response to the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling against him. And I, the longer I'm a pastor, the more I'm like, oh, grumbling. Yeah, that's kind of what we do. I do it too. But man, we do it. <laughs> uh, it it's incredible how, how ready we are to kind of snipe and whine about what Jesus says and does. And so what are they sniping and whining about? Well, there's too many people coming to believe in Jesus. That's what it, There's a bunch of like repentant people, people with real backgrounds, real past. They're not the kind of people we want to have hanging around our kids. And here they are with Jesus. And so they, they grumble about it. And he's like, what are you guys talking about? Now, you can get into a, a bit off track here with is this the way a shepherd would really act? But I think that misses the entire point. And the entire point is when you lose something, don't you like go find it? 
Like if you care about it, if it's a valuable thing to you, don't you make every effort that you can to go get that thing? So don't don't get hung up on, you know, the 99 sheep that he left behind and how he doesn't, you know, they they could have been destroyed by them, but this is how deep his love is. Well, yeah, sort of. Who knows if there's other shepherds there and whatnot. It's, it's not his point. His point is that if you lose something, you go find it. And you know this because of the, the counter parable that comes with the lady who lights the lamp, sweeps the house, finds her silver coin and tells everybody, hey, I found my coin. Yeah. I, mean, I tell you, if you had if you had 10 Bitcoin, you lost one of them and you found it again, you'd be pretty stoked. You'd be like, dude, I lost my Bitcoin, but I found it. You tell the story. Now you tell the story. And that is what Jesus is saying, that he has come down here because he lost something. It was stolen from him. Huh? You, you were stolen from him and he's come down to get you back because he really just cares that much. And so when he finds you, he's pretty excited about it. And so are all the angels in heaven. They're excited about it too. And God, the father, he's pretty excited about it as well. And it really doesn't matter where you were lost. You know, were you lost in a prostitution den? Were you lost in a tax collector's job? <laughs> Where were you lost? It doesn't matter. What matters is that his desire is to find you. I will, I will, I will feed my sheep. Huh? Mm, good stuff. How will I feed my sheep with the pure doctrine? That is the charge that brings justification, judging you faithful and freeing your conscience that you might be released back into a life of love. I hope this helps with your weekly preparations. Mad Christian Monday, checking out, signing off, and uh, we'll catch you on the flip side. Rock on.